also trying to figure out, Brother Painter, you may be able to help me with this, is once we, if we can title a recorded service on Zoom, if we're able to, you know, add a title to it. So when you go back through the recordings, you can find specific subjects that you've talked about would be really helpful, I think, rather than just dates, you know. And if we right. take these Zoom meetings and put them on on, fa on Facebook or our, our YouTube channel, it would be very helpful to people if they can look up a certain subject. So that's something I'm, I was looking at today, but I got interrupted and never did get to. Continue yes, sir, we can, we can do that for sure. Um, let's see. Um, brother, um, brother Bai uh, has asked a question about Luke 16. And um, I, let's see if I can address this question. Um, let's see here. Let me let that in. I'm going to maybe try to share my page with y'all. There, I think y'all can see that. I hope I can still see um, if somebody's wanting to get in. So we may have to make some changes there. I just looked up the word unjust here and, and uh, um, Um, yeah, I'm still seeing who's wanting to get in. Um, in Acts 24:15, here he's saying, I'll start in the 14th verse, but this I confess unto thee that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and the prophets, and have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. This word unjust, just looking at it here in the Greek word, um, by extension, wicked, by implication, treacherous, especially heathen, unjust, or unrighteous. Where if you look at the word just, you're going to see that that word just means to be righteous. So unjust is to be unrighteous. Just is to be righteous. Um, also upright, virtuous. Um, Brother Linegar, uh, he gave these words for being just, um, faithful, blessed, saint, um, wise, um, upright, um, let's see, upright, just, righteous, um, wise, blessed. Um, here, it looks like you could add virtuous to that. Um, and so uh, here, Paul is talking about 
you know, because he's called in question concerning the just and the unjust. And uh, he's referring that the people that's accusing him are accusing him of believing in, in both the just and unjust resurrections. Now, of course, we've always, uh, in the body for many, many years, we always looked at the resurrection of the just and the unjust as being the final resurrection after the after the thousand years. Uh, Brother Leninger made an adjustment on that, and I, I tend to agree with Brother Leninger um, that that final resurrection in Revelations 20. Let's go there. I'll go back to your Luke 16th chapter here in a minute, Brother By. But um, in Revelations 20, right here in verse 11, it says, I saw a great white throne. Uh, maybe I should back up a little bit to uh, right here in verse 6, where he's saying, Blessed holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such, the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and Christ and shall reign with him for a thousand years. So these that are in the first resurrection are those that make the bride and rule and reign with Christ is what that's talking about. They won't be hurt, uh, or second death won't have any power over them because they've overcome sin and inherited eternal life already. So second death, which is a lake of fire, he says here in this chapter. Uh, so second death, wouldn't have any power over these people. But then when he can't, continues on and shows that when the thousand years are expired, Satan will be loosened out of his prison or loosed out of his prison. Um, and, and what I say about that is, um, if you back up here to the third verse, or, well, let's just read the first and second. I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Uh, that chain is just a generation of righteous people that have finally, those that reach the bride will bind Satan with Christ on earth there during the thousand years. Um, and it said it, and he laid on uh, hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan and bound him a thousand years. That's, this is the only verse outside of the 12th chapter of Revelation that has all four titles given to evil, the dragon, the serpent, the devil, and Satan. There's only two places in any verse has all four of them mentioned there. Anyway, so the Satan is bound for a thousand years and cast him into a bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled and after that, he must be loosed a little season. In other words, uh, the way I explain that and try to relate it to people for people is um, how, how Satan's going to be bound for a thousand years. It'll be much more uh, effective than what I'm going to say, but I like to use the, the uh, thought of how in the United States, back in the um, 40s, you might say, uh, Satan was bound to an extent in this country, and I'm sure he was in other countries, 
to an extent, evil was. Evil was bound because righteousness prevailed in such a way that if people were going to sin, they would do it in, in the closet, so to speak, or they would they would hide. Uh, you know, they you wouldn't hear people just curse openly. You wouldn't hear, you wouldn't, you know, people would were more fearful and condemned of outright sin than they are today. And it's because that evil was bound by the righteousness of God's word and God's righteous people than they are than it is today. But now during the thousand years, it will be bound uh, much in a much greater way because righteousness will prevail where wickedness is prevailing today. And the majority will will of uh, uh, will be in righteousness. You know, this little stone in Daniel two that's going to be hurled at the feet of the image is going to is going to break the image into pieces, and that little stone will just get bigger and bigger and bigger until it fills the whole earth. That's the word. Of, that's the the body of Christ or God's people. So. Um, so the rest of the, it says, will not live until the thousand years. Uh, well, wait a minute. Let's go back here. Revelations 20. Um, where's that part at here? Okay, verse five. But the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. So here... Um, uh, Satan's going to be loosed, and how that the wickedness uh, of the adversary, or you know, is going to be loosed, is going to be people are going to resurrect, and they're going to they're going to be unjust. They're going to resurrect in the same spirit they died in, and that's going to loose Satan or the adversary and wickedness for a. It'll have to be at least for uh, at least a short period of time until they come under uh, judgment. So here in verse 11, it says, I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. And uh, and I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Well, um, here, the books, it said the books were open. Well, if you look at that, that book, is a scroll, a writing, um, it's a record. The, these books that were opened. Now we've taught how we've related to that in the past that, that we're talking about um, the uh, uh, men have said that th that's the book of, of remembrance that and, and that is what it is, but I've carried it further in understanding that these books that are opened is your case. It's, if, if you resurrect in the final resurrection, the book of God's remembrance of everything you've done in life, in other words, your, your case is going to be before God, and God is going to judge you in that final resurrection, just like he's, gonna, he's judging us right now. The book, you know, my life is a record. God's got a record of everything in my life, righteous and unrighteous. And every deed that I have uh, done, God's going to judge. Uh, you know, he's not like a judge is sitting on a throne, you know, and says, oh, he did bad. I'm going to get him now. That's not how God works. God judges, you know, with... Uh, information, instruction, correction, chastisement. God 
God may, at first, God will just try to get you to understand right from wrong, to discern. Paul said in Hebrews 5, he that's a full age uh, discerns both good and evil. He understood he's of a full age. He understands what's right and what's wrong. But uh, if you're looking at, uh, uh, you know, a younger person in Christ, a babe in Christ, they, they're not going to have all the understanding. And so God's judgment to him who much is given, much is required. So as you grow and develop in age, of maturity in God, God's going to require more of you. And, but God won't require as much of a babe in Christ. They're, they're a baby. They, they need milk, not strong to, to, until they grow. And so, <clears throat> but here, these books were open and another book was open, which is the book of life. Well, that's the word of God. That is the book of life. And of course, if you've been born again and you're serving God, you have life. You're, you're in that book. God's got your, your name. You're, you're included in that book. But it is the word of God that, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. So this is God's a judgment seat down there of God resurrecting those uh, both small and great, but now we got to see who resurrects. The sea gives up the dead that were in it. Well, the sea, the 17th chapter of the book of Revelations, we're told, uh, the angel tells John that the sea that he saw that this beast came up in was people, nations, and tongues. We can, we can go there and look at it right there. Just you know, so everyone can can see. Let's see if it'll come up here. The waters. Here's Revelations 15. And he said unto me, The waters which thou sawest where the poor sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. The sea, uh, you know, if you if you go back to the 13th uh, chapter, then the uh, John sees right in the very first work, I stood on the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea. Well, what rose up, it rose up out of multitudes, nations, and tongues. It rose up out of the world, uh, having seven heads and 10 horns, and on the, his horns, 10 crowns, and upon his heads, the name of blasphemy. Well, and then the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. That in Daniel 7, the leopard was Greece. And this beast that come up, which which this this beast here that rose up out of sin, Revelations 13, uh, one is talking about the papacy, the Pope of Rome. Uh, he was given power by Constantine in AD 325. But this beast rose up out of the world, out of the sea. It was like Greece in many of its governmental characteristics. And it, it, its feet, his feet were the feet of a bear. Um, the, the legs and feet of Rome had two parts to it. They were both iron. Where the bear, which made a Persia, two, there was two parts of it, the two arms in Daniel 2. And then his mouth is the mouth of a lion. That was Babylon. So this Rome, this is talking about the Rome, and it's, it's the papacy that developed out of all of this. And then the dragon, which is pagan Rome, gave him the papacy, his power, and his seat and great authority. So there was a change of power in Rome. It was still Rome. Both legs in Daniel 2 were, were iron legs. They were both made of iron. It's all part of the same dragon or kingdom. But Constantine gives his power to the Pope. And the Pope becomes a beast power through the remainder of the Roman Empire. 
from AD 325 until 1798. And so um, I'm just showing you there the C, these, these that are dead, that is in Revelations 20, that the dead gives up those that are in it. So let's go back to that right quick. So right here, let's see, that's Revelation 17. So let's see if I go back to 20. No. Oh. Normally I'm just back up, but I didn't want to do it. Okay. So the sea, verse 13 here, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it. Well, okay, the, the ungodly are not going to come up in judgment. Psalms 1 tells us that. So those that are in the sea are God's people, but they went out into the world. There's many of God's people in the world today. They're, they're either victims, they were hurt. Uh, are they starved to death spiritually? They, they were born again, but they could not get enough understanding uh, of the bread of life that they could stay uh, connected. And so they may have gave up. Uh, some of them out there in Babylon just give up and go back into the world. Some of them do that in the body of Christ. But these people are God's people, but they're out in the world. So there's a difference between the ungodly and what Paul called an ungodly sinner. As to he that he that knoweth to do right and doeth it not to him it's sin. So an ungodly sinner is one of God's people living among the ungodly and sinning knowingly that, uh, about what they're doing. An ungodly person doesn't have, they've never known God. They've never been born again. They're part of the world and part of the ungodly, and they don't stand in judgment. But so the sea here gives up the dead that's in it. That's God's people that's out in the sea of humanity, but they're God's people. They're, they either backslid, they starved to death, they were victims. Whatever reason they're back in the world, they're in the sea, and they're going to be unjust. Yes, at one point, they were just. If they were born again, they were counted worthy. As Roman 4 tells us, that not only did God impute righteousness to Abraham because of his faith, he imputed righteousness to all of us. Uh, what Christ did on the cross, it, it counts us worthy because of the work that Christ did, and none of us were 100% uh, uh, full age yet and overcome sin, but, but God, if we're doing, living a dedicated life and serving God, then he's counting us worthy. He's imputed righteousness to us. Uh, we're justified by that. We're justified by our faith, Paul said. And so we're just, uh, we're among the just if we're living a faithful life. If we're living the life of a saint, upright, faithful, wise, blessed, virtuous, uh, uh, saint of God, you know, child of God. Okay, so the, the sea gives up the dead that's in it, and then death and hell delivered up the dead that were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. Well, uh, so death and hell. And I think we need to stick with prophetical uh, scripture if you remember in the sixth chapter of the book of Revelation, the, the pale horse, the pale horse, uh, the rider of that horse was death and hell followed with it. Um, this hell right here is, 
it's it's showing that it's a hand, departed souls or a grave or hell. It's it's translated in different ways in the New Testament, but but death, uh, those that death is reigning in their life. Death reigned in the rider of the pale horse because there was no anointing or unction to the ministry of the Catholic Church. God wasn't in that. Uh, and death, it, they could not produce life, in other words. And people who have uh, that, that maybe they have, they, they've met a place where they received God, they became a child of God, but they're not living in a place where life is, is substantial in their life, death's reigning in their life. I'd explain it this way. There's people in our churches that are not living a dedicated life and death is reigning in their life. They're not just, they're unjust, they're not righteous. They're not living a righteous life. They may come to church, but they're not living a righteous life. And, and most churches have somebody like that in them. But it doesn't necessarily, uh, I mean, if they haven't went out into the world, they're either in, in, in a place where they're, they hadn't went into the world, but they're not living a righteous life either. They could be in the body or they could be in Babylon, but that includes hell. Hell followed with death in that uh, pale horse. And uh, so those people, they were in a hellish religious condition. Babylon, uh, and and if they died in that condition and they were just, I think there are people that died in Babylon that are just. They're doing everything they knew to do. They served God the best way they knew how, and I think they were just. But I think that there's many people that are unjust. They they're not living right, and they're not even trying to live right. They you know, I mean. Uh, they're in a religious condition. They may be deceived that they're still not righteous. But they, if they're God's people, they're going to come up. They're going to resurrect. God is not going to judge anybody uh, without them hearing the truth and having the truth manifested. I'm talking about his children. So here, death and hell delivers up the dead that were in them so I'm not seeing anybody in this final resurrection that's just. And yes, you can be a child of God and you can become unjust. You can quit serving God faithfully. You can, you can uh, become like Brother Ba asked the question, can you be an unjust steward? Yes, you can. Uh, th then notice here, verse 14, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is second death. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Well, notice it doesn't mention the sea here. And the reason it doesn't is because death, uh, the sea gives up the dead that's in it. And they're no longer in the sea. They're not going to be in the sea. They're going to resurrect there as a child of God, unjust to be dealt with. And so there's no longer, they're not going to long, they're not going to go back into the sea. The sea doesn't exist at that time. During the thousand year uh, millennial, at the end of the thousand years, God will have conquered. The world will be, have become righteous. But Isaiah say that, um, if someone dies at a hundred in that world, they would be cursed. So there'll be people during the thousand years that will overcome sin and just inherit e eternal life. They'll go right on living. There'll be people probably that'll be older than Methuselah. You know, they'll have lived longer than Methuselah and just inherit eternal life and then go on throughout eternity. But God, after a thousand years, is going to 
resurrect those unjust people and are going to get an opportunity to see and hear the truth of the word of God. And those that won't receive it will go into second death, the lake of fire. And anyone found in the not found in the book of life will be cast into the lake of fire, which is second death. That would be eternal judgment uh, to judge them eternally unworthy of life. So if, if it, uh, I'm going to go back to Luke 16, but if anybody's got a question or a comment, that's fine. Um, well, Smith, uh, may I ask you a quick question? Sure. sure. Okay. Uh, you made mention of the uh, um, those that are uh, in the religious world. No, I. You said that God, God has His people, just people in the religious world, and uh, is it because they haven't, they have not heard about the truth? Because uh, in Revelation chapter 18, it's saying that, you know, come out of her, my people. So um, the fact that they, they live in up to the measure of truth that they have received, and they have, not, they have not heard about the truth to come out of her. So what about those, for example, if I am at her and I've heard the truth, come out of her and I, I decide not to come out, will that make me become unjust? Yes, you'd be unjust. If God, if God deals with you and you hear the voice of God calling you out of Babylon and you reject it, you're unjust. You couldn't be just and, and reject God. See, God, just like in the early church, if you go back to the early church and those that were among the Jewish faith and those that uh, I'm not talking about necessarily when Jesus was alive and on the earth, mm -hmm. but after he died and went back to heaven and sent back the Holy Ghost, he came back in the, in spiritual, mm -hmm. in a spiritual uh, way on the day of Pentecost. And through the ministry, through those 12 apostles and those that received them and, and entered into the ministry under their apostolic order they god called many with ma manifestation uh many ways did god manifest to that world back there um himself and called those people out of judaism into the body of christ mm -hmm. those that rejected that that was a that was and, and look, some of them rejected it for a while, but then they came in later. For an example, the Apostle Paul, he rejected the Lord. He rejected the body of Christ. He rejected Jesus. But when God dealt with him, he, he, he submitted and repented, and, and uh, God touched him, and his eyes were opened to, to the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. But those that rejected that manifestation of God that, that's what made them unjust is, you know, right now, if God deals with the person and God's really dealing with them and they, you know, they're wrestling with submitting and turning over to God and repenting and they just can't do it. Mm -hmm. They're unjust in that. It doesn't mean God won't keep dealing with them, but they can't get forgiveness. You cannot get forgiveness if you won't repent. If you won't yield to God's call in your life and you won't repent, you can't get any forgiveness. And so, uh, but we don't have the same manifestation today mm -hmm. that they had back there in the uh, body of Christ in the end of the Jewish world. Mm -hmm. God was basically harvesting the Jews out of that world. Mm -hmm. It harvests some of the, uh, there were some of the um, um, 
some of the Gentiles. There were some of the Gentiles that I think made the bride back there, but not, you know, it would be a small amount compared to the whole Gentile world that was yet to come in through the planting of Paul. And then um, those Jews back there that were, or those that weren't Jews that were proselytes, like Cornelius, for an example. He was a proselyte to Judaism before, before he would be considered part of the Gentile work that Paul was working with. So there were proselytes that came in and accepted Jew, the Jewish religion, the law, the old covenant. They came into the old covenant, like Cornelius' house, for an example. But uh, when God called them into the body of Christ, they came into it. Anyone that would have rejected that move of God from the day of Pentecost to AD 70 would have to be unjust. They'd be unjust in rejecting what God had showed them. We've never had nothing. We've had revivals. We've had very many strong uh, movings of God, but we've never had nothing that would compare to the early church, the manifestation that God, the glory of God that was shown in that church was called the day of the world of, of the day of the Lord. It was also called the glory of the Lord. It was also called the end, uh, the last days. Jesus said he would raise them up in the last day. That that's in, um, uh, let's look in, I think that's in John six, where he said that let's, See if we can find that scripture real quick. Mm. See if he said, oh, wait, I'm in John 12. I thought I was in John 6. Okay. Right here in verse 39, it said, And this is the Father's will which has sent me that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. That's talking about the end, the day of the Lord and the end of the Jewish world. God is not going to do that until he until it's time to harvest a world. And uh, he said, and this, and this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Uh, if you go down a little further, no man can come to me, verse 44, except the Father which has sent me, draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Those These last days, Here's another one there in 54. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. You're, God is not going to, he's not going to gather people out of harvest time. He's only going to gather people during this day of the Lord at the time that he's harvesting that world. That's why we see that there was a resurrection of the just in Matthew 27, 52, that God resurrected those people of the old covenant that, that were of faith. They were justified by their faith from righteous Abel. Uh, we don't know how many there were. Uh, they were, uh, how Paul said it, they were, of a, they were a great cloud of witnesses. Revelations, I mean, uh, Hebrews 12, 1 those people in the 11th chapter that he described, they, without us, Paul said, were not made perfect. They, they had hopes of a better resurrection than just resurrecting from the dead. They had hopes that there'd be a resurrection that, that God could finish his work in them. That took place in the last day of the Jew. That's talking about the last day of the Jewish world. So, um now now what you were talking about in 
in, uh, well, let me see if I, let me see if I back up to Luke 16 here. Um, the 19th verse there is talking about the rich man. And of course, he's, here he's fixing to give the parable of the, the rich man uh, and Lazarus. Uh, and this, this is the parable of Lazarus. Let, let's read just a little bit of it. Let me see what time it is here. So we got just a little bit of time. So there was a certain man, the 19th verse here, certain rich man, which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. Um, that man would would have to be the Jew. That's a picture of the Jew. He was rich in the things of God, God's elect. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which laid at his gate full of sores, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. That, that is a picture of the Jews the, the, the Jews, they were carried into Abraham's bosom or Abraham's covenant. The Jews finally were able to uh, added to the covenant of Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried, and, it, and in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and, and seeth Abraham far off and Lazarus in his bosom. And so here, uh, the same hell that, that, that is going to, people are going to resurrect from. Uh, but, but here, in the, in, this is talking about uh, how that the Jew died and went into a hellish condition because they rejected the Lord. They're still in a hellish condition today. He goes on and tells that, but the beggar winds up in Abraham's bosom or in Abraham's covenant. And, and so he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip it, the finger, the tip of his finger in cold water and cool my tongue for I'm tormented in this flame. That's just a picture of the Jew that has been under judgment for rejecting their Savior and the Messiah all these years that they were judged and rejected of God in AD 70, God turned to the Gentiles. But he goes on here and says, but Abraham said, son, remember when thou in this in thy lifetime receivest thy the good things and likewise Lazarus the evil things, but now he's comforted and you're tormented. It just, it just reversed. The Gentile came under God's graces and the, and the Jews were under God's curse or God's judgment. And besides this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. In other words, he's saying, there's a great gulf between the Gentiles and the Jews in, in his parable here that he's telling about. The, there's a great gulf fixed that the Gentile can't, come, can't get to you, can't reach you. Y'all still will not accept Christ, and we can't. y'all can't get to us. That, there's that great gulf that separated these two classes of people. Then he said, I pray. Therefore, be therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Well, at that time, it was Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo Persia, and Greece, that he had five brethren that the Jews had been under prior to him, which was under Rome, pagan Rome. Uh, and he said, Come and, and touch the Jew that we can get out of this torment. And Abraham said unto him, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, nay, my, 
uh, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will not, they will, uh, from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto them, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. That was a true, that was the truth in his parable <coughs> that they didn't believe Moses and the prophets that Jesus was the Messiah. He died and rose from the dead, and they still wouldn't accept him as being their Messiah. And so, <clears throat> uh, so it's just a picture there that there, there is a gulf. And he, he was showing in this parable that the Jews were those that were just under the law became unjust when they rejected Jesus Christ. And that those that were unjust among the Gentiles that accepted the Lord in the calling of the Lord, they became just. And there's been this great gulf fix. Of course, you know, in Romans um, 11, Paul shows how that um, blindness in part has happened to the Jews. Uh, Amos and Hosea mentioned, Zechariah mentions, when they see him whom, who they pierced, you know, it won't be until they actually recognize that they, that their forefathers made a mistake and rejected the very Messiah, that they will repent and they'll recognize him and they'll be grafted back in, like Paul said, but it wouldn't be until the fullness of the Gentiles. See, it's not God's time yet to reach out to the Jew, but all of God's people now, even the unjust, whatever covenant they were in, they're going to come up in the resurrection of the unjust. Those, it, it's reasonable to see that God resurrected the just of the Old Testament uh, old covenant to resurrect them for a better resurrection that they without us are without that ministry of the early church they couldn't be made perfect but they had hopes for that and they came forth for that and the same way all of the those that are just from the falling away of the church until the restoration of the church that's where we have that scripture in, in Revelations 19. I'm sorry, in Revelations 11, where the time of the dead, uh, right here in verse 18, and the nations were angry. This is in Revelations 11, 18. And thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints. See, that includes the prophets, the ministry, and the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and should destroy them that destroy their earth. So here's a time, and this is in the last prophetical hour, if you notice right here in the 15th verse, the seventh angel sounded. This is the last sound. The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. That's Armageddon. So here's the last prophetical hour that takes place. And during that last prophetical hour, the time of the dead, God's going to reward them. He's not just rewarding people that are just dead unto sin. He, he's talking about those that are dead and in the graves. Uh, they're going to come forth. And look, in verse 19, it says, and the temple of God was opened in heaven. It's closed. It's been closed. You can't get into third heaven right now. It's going to take our last day. See, the, the Jew had the day of the Lord. It was the last day or end time of the Jewish world. We will have a last day or end time, the day of the Lord and the end of the Gentile world. And so uh, 
God is here. Here, the temple's going to be open. Somebody asked me one time, said, when was, when was it ever closed? I said, the very fact it shows it's open proves to you it was closed. Why would he open it? If it, if it was already open, he don't need to open it. But it was, it was closed when the church fell away. When the church fell away, there wasn't no way to get in second heaven, much less third heaven. So the temple of God, and that is second heaven, by the way, the holy place, that is, the, that is what takes you into third heaven. It takes a holy, a holy place. It takes the sevenfold light of God. <clears throat> it takes the altar of incense and the, the uh, uh, sevenfold unleavened bread. The, I mean, the, the, I'm sorry, the, the 12 loaves of unleavened bread. So the temple is going to be open. There was seen in the temple, the Ark of His Testament. There was lightnings and voices and thunderings and earthquake and great hail. That's lightnings. It's great revelation that God's going to give when the church is restored. Voices, uh, you know, uh, God is going to give those who have a voice of authority thunderings. Those are... Uh, some of them are even going to be staggering uh, revelations and an earthquake. There's going to be shaking. So it's going to be such a great move of God. It'll shake the world and great hell judgment will go with it. So God is going to open, uh, open heaven. So anyway, I hope that maybe I've uh, said something that would help here. If anybody's got any comments or questions, feel free. I think I can stop sharing right here. Uh, so back with everybody, I think I got everybody in uh, and we're still recording, but um, anyway, the, I think the main question was, is can you be, uh, can you be just and then become unjust? The answer is absolutely. You can, uh, it's shown many times uh, in the Bible that a person uh, was just. I, you know, I, I could give you some examples of First Corinthians 5, the man who had his father's wife that Paul had to disfellowship him. He was a member of the church. At some point, he must have been uh, just to even get added in. You get you're justified once you accept Christ. Until you you know commit uh, unjust or unlawful or unrighteous acts to the point that you're no longer diligently serving the Lord in faith. That you've went against the Word of God. Um, who uh, help me with some names. Who was a man that Hymenus and Philetus? You know, they, they turned against Paul. Uh, the, you know the the men that uh, on in Ephesus that were elders. Uh, Paul had elders over churches. When he told them, he said, "I'm going to tell you this weeping. This will be the last time you see my face." But after my departure, grievous world wolves will enter in, spoiling the flock. Men of your own selves rising up, making disciples of your own selves. Uh, you know, those men, no doubt, they were righteous. They were righteous elders. But at some point, they became unrighteous. Paul prophesied that, that they would do the wrong thing. I've alluded here recently to the letter to the church at Ephesus, one of the seven letters in Asia, that that church knew that those, those who said they were apostles, they found them to be liars and found out they weren't. I think it's very reasonable to think that some of those men were men Paul talked to in Acts 20, said when he said, men of your own selves, um, uh, that would rise up, spoiling the flock, uh, making disciples, after your own selves, and 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 you know, speaking perverse things, he said, 
I, I think it's reasonable to think that some of these uh, people that declared to be apostles were not. And they were probably some of them, those men Paul prophesied what would they would do. They became unjust is my point. So you definitely can become unjust. You're not this, this doctrine of uh, once saved, always saved is a false doctrine. That's not true. You, just because you're once saved, you've got to stay faithful and continue to serve God. You can't turn back into the world and do whatever you want to do. My wife, you know, she was, when she was a little bitty girl, she was christened in the Catholic church. And uh, so I don't remember exactly how it happened, but she was telling a, a nun many years ago that she was christened in the Catholic church. And, uh, but she said, but I'm not, I don't go to the Catholic church and I'm not part of the Catholic church anymore. And that nun said, don't worry, honey, once a Catholic, always a Catholic. <laughs> so, so, you know, they, I guess they, they hold on to that. If you've ever christened in the Catholic church, you got heaven's gates so open for you. But uh, anyway, Sister McNam, I think you know something about that. You come from that line, don't you? So anyway, um, I hope Brother By said something that would would uh, maybe clarify your question there. We we can talk more on um, the just and the unjust. Um, uh, you know, it simply does mean righteous and unrighteous. And, but there is a resurrection of the unrighteous people of God. And, but it doesn't look to me like, now we, we've taught this and, and I think everyone ought to, you know, hold steady because uh, that is my, my perspective. That's how I see it. Uh, there's men in the body that still teach the way it was taught traditionally that there will be just and unjust people come up. There, there are several factions among the brethren that God just hasn't got it worked out with us yet. There's some brethren that don't believe any, nobody has ever resurrected and won't until down here in the restored church, they think Jesus will come back. And only those that made the bride will resurrect and go to heaven and be a part of the bride. Those that make it down here in the restored church and those that already made it in the early church are where are they ever they made it. And they don't think anybody else, if you didn't make the bride, you won't come up until the end of the five, thousand years. Then there's other brethren that does believe that there were some that resurrected in the early church. They believe in the resurrection I mentioned in Matthew 27, 52. And those people resurrected to make the bride and probably most did make the bride. And they were caught up into heaven. Uh, well, they might would hold on to them being under the altar under the golden altar. That's still a question among us. Um, and then there's those that, like myself and Brother Linegar, and there's several others that believe that, that, that there was a resurrection in the early church. There'd be another resurrection down here in the restored church. For the just, why wouldn't God? If God, if, why wouldn't God resurrect you if you were just? Or for the purpose of making the bride. And so uh, why wouldn't he do it again down here? Uh, and why would he resurrect people that were just down there just because they lived at a time when it wasn't available? That doesn't sound like God to me. It's, God seems to be uh, very fair in the way he deals with things and that he if you're just and you live a just life, then I think that scripture in Revelations 11 is pretty plain that God, God's going to reward his prophets and his saints. The time of the dead. 
what, what's that talking about? I don't think you could say you're talking about the time of those that died in Christ. I'm talking about they died out to sin, they're alive, but they're dead to the world, but alive unto God. I think that time, I think we're in that, some of us are in that time right now. I'm alive unto God and living a life dead to the world. I'm not part of the world. So there's a specific time. It's in the last prophetical hour. The last seventh, eight, seventh trumpet is going to sound, and there's going to be some dead that it's time for those dead to be rewarded. I think it would be less than reasonable not to see that there's a resurrection going to take place there of just people. And it's hard to find how they're just in the sea, death, or hell. That's difficult. All right. God bless all of you. Let's, let's pray before we go home uh, or before we take off our shirts and ties. We're already at home. <laughs> put on our pajamas, so to speak. But we do have, you know, we've got several needs. We've got a meeting next week in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, at the convention center. And um, so there'll be many traveling. We've got this new variant that's come out. We don't know very much about it right now. Um, you know, this thing doesn't seem to be over. Hopefully, they're going to find out this variant is not near as bad a deal as they think it is, and that even the vaccines that we've taken may work against the variant. Uh, we don't know. We just don't know much about it. They're, they're saying things about it don't sound good, but on the other hand, nobody has died with it that they know of, but they already have found a case in California, so it's here in America. Um, Brother Bill Daniels, I'm, I'm, I'm keeping him before the Lord. I'm asking God to touch that man. So he's got basically congestive heart failure. He just needs a touch. He can't get the fluid off of his body. And it's just, he just suffers with it. Brother Ray Weaver, I, I visited him this week, and prayed for him. And uh, he's able to stand up. And he wasn't able to do hardly anything, but he's, he can stand up and shuffle around a little bit, but he can't go very far. He's just too weak. So they certainly do need our prayers, uh, the Weaver family. Sister Crow, let's keep remembering her. She's not able to come to church anymore. She's living with her daughter, Judy. Uh, and um, brother, Sister Matheny, her, her kids. So let's remember them. Um, Brother Smith? Yes. Have you heard about Brother Tim Hughes and his family? No. They had um, about 33 people together for Thanksgiving, and Brother Tim Hughes and his wife and Rachel, uh, there's, there's six or seven of them have got COVID. I got a prayer, prayer request come in about 8.30 here. Sister Hughes is in the ICU about to be put on a ventilator. Oh, and wow. Brother Tim Hughes is not doing well either. Wow. Yeah. All right. We sure do need to pray for Brother and Sister Hughes and those people there. Yeah, I think she said 33. There were 33 of them. And, but, sir, did they all get COVID? Or just there, I've of heard of seven right now. Whether seven. others are coming down or with it or not, I don't yeah. know. Wow. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's try to remember that. Um, I'm trying to think of what else we got here. I know there's all kinds of needs. Uh, Brother Goss, we need to remember Brother Goss. Mm -hmm. He's back in the hospital, isn't he, with a UTI? And they found a kidney in, stone too. Kidney stone. And he's just in and out right now, and so he's 80 88. 88. Yeah. So. Uh, Brother Goss, his, his age is really affecting him, no doubt. So let's keep him in our prayers in the Keswick Church. Uh, you know, anytime your your pastor is sick and uh, and not able to be in church, and then you got this pandemic on top of that, 
you know, any church going through that needs to be held up in prayer. So let's remember them. Uh, I'm sure Brother Strite's family would still appreciate prayer for them. Brother Lewis in Norfolk, Virginia's little grandson that started chemotherapy. Uh, who else was telling me they just started some real strong chemotherapy? I don't think who that was. Brother Smith, we should remember mm -hmm. Sister Donna Henderson and her family. They're, they've got some condition. They don't know if it's COVID or what, but they're, she's sick. Her brother, I think her brother's sick and her mom. All right, let's remember that. Sister Donna Henderson. Um, Sister... Sister uh, Crafton, Julie Crafton's had a recently had a stroke. For those of you that don't know, and she's doing good and improving, but we just want to keep her in our prayers. Uh, she's working from her home. She works for Blue Cross Blue Shield, and so she doesn't have. She probably couldn't go back to work if she's not able to do it from home. But she's went back to work, but she's still, you know, a long ways from back to normal, so she does need her prayers. Sister Durham's mother, uh, Sister Leslie Hayes, uh, she lives in Springfield, Missouri, and, and she's, how old is she, 91, Brother Durham? 90? Yes, yeah, um, she's 91. 91, so, and she's not doing well. They're having to put her in a nursing home or our facility and so pray for sister Durham's mother just getting that time for her all right uh, so we'll turn our microphones unmute them so we can pray together and uh, um, see if we can ask God to help us uh, the, I will announce for the um uh, Church here in Little Rock, we're having a work day Saturday morning at 8 o'clock. Uh, so everyone, if you know, try to, especially you men, but we, it would even be good if we had some women come to help with the thing of the church. We'll have a wedding coming up the 12th, is it, of December? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Let's all pray and ask God. Thank you, Thank you, Jesus. Dear God, Thank you. ask you to God touch. Touch these that are sick in their bodies. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, we love you. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. Touch on our lives. For us to ask you to help us, Lord God. Thank you, Lord. 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 Thank you